we have to take. Someone like me have been having on and off, today I'm on, tomorrow I'm off, with the cancer saga. So this, um, today's meeting is very important to each and every one of us. So you are all welcome. Please feel free to drop in your questions, no interruption, just drop in your questions. And at the end of each section, we read the questions out and uh, we get a good explanation to whatever that is bothering us or to whatever kind of food we need to stick. So thank you so much. Welcome, Ma. welcome doctors. God bless you all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want you all to join me to welcome our first speaker in the person of Dr. Olado Ibo Catherine Adebukola. Um, she is a nutritionist and also a dietitian at the Department of um, Nutrition and Dietetics at Federal University of Agriculture, Abiokuta. Ma, we greatly thank you so much for making our time to be at this very important meeting. Uh, we know you're very, very busy, considering also with COVID-19. And thanks for all the great work you've been doing, especially in research, you know, around nutrition, uh, especially for people living with cancer. Thank you so much. Uh, you, are, you have the floor now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I want to say that I'm very glad to be here with you. Um, the, um, today I'm to talk on nutrition, cancer, and COVID-19. Next slide. Okay. Now, there are some factors that have been associated with some dietary factors that have been linked with um, the issue of cancer. Um, things like obesity, alcohol consumption, the cooking of meat at very high temperatures, grilling of meat, um, consumption of diet that is high in red meat and processed meat, and the kind of fat that we eat and the amount of fat have also been linked to be one of the risk factors for cancer. Next slide. So if you look at this chart, you see that um, there are several um, factors that have been pointed out here to predispose one to different kinds of cancers. And for example, um, it's been said that from the literature that obesity is a risk factor for cancer of the esophagus, of the colon, of the rectum, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the kidney, and the breast cancer. So um, the next slide also shows the next slide shows that um, the factors that can decrease the risk of cancer. And if you look at this slide, several examples have been given here. Um, fruits and non starchy vegetables have been shown to reduce the um, risk of lung cancer, mouth, uh, cancer of the pharynx, larynx, esophagus, and cancer of the stomach. That is what these two charts are just basically showing. So then going to the topic that we have today, nutrition, cancer, and COVID-19. The next slide, please. Now, if you look at this recent development about COVID-19, you all agree with me that it's a, new, it's a new disease and even the health professionals themselves, they're just still trying to understand all the interactions that exist between this virus, the, 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 treat, the oncology treatment and the oncology situation. So the physicians themselves are just, just trying to understand how this virus interacts with the issue of cancer. Other challenges that we see with this COVID-19 issue is that a lot of shift has gone into handling the issue of COVID-19. Health capacity, infrastructural, um, in infrastructures, everything is moving towards, you know, um, handling the disease because it's become like a priority. And if you look at um, cancer patients that are active, they are more vulnerable to complications that can arise from this viral infection. And then this can lead to comorbidities, you know, within the individual. 
So patients that are on treatment for cancer, you know, may have some, because of the treatment, they may suffer some um, immunosuppressive issues, and then this makes them to be at a higher risk of having complications that arises from COVID-19 if they get infected. The next slide. So, how does nutrition then play a key role in the issue of um, cancer and COVID-19? You'll all agree with me that nutritional status of any individual is one indicator that determines how that person becomes resilient to any form of destabilization, especially when it comes to the issue of disease or infection. And diet quality, the quality of the diet of that person is particularly important, you know, that it determines how resilient that individual will be. And so when we talk about diet quality, we're talking about there are various components that make up the quality of the diet of a person, the variety in the diet, the adequacy of the diet, and moderation in the diet. Those are issues within diet quality that determine how the nutritional um, status of the individual will look like. And so if you look at COVID-19, one of the major things, one of the major issues that drive this infection, you know, it's a link between the diet and the immunity of that individual. The link between, um, nutrition then stands as a link between um, having the disease and becoming resistant to that infect to the infection or to the disease. The next slide. So um, this slide here is trying to show um, the relationship between malnutrition and infection. So when we talk about malnutrition, malnutrition exists in different forms. Micronutrient deficiency, it could also be some protein energy malnutrition. But there is always a relationship between malnutrition and every infection. And so if you look at this particular slide, what the slide is trying to explain to us is that when somebody becomes infected with COVID-19, for example, then basically with every infection, there will always be a decrease in nutrient intake. The person loses appetite, is not wanting to eat. Um, there is nutrient loss because of the infection. Nutrients are not well absorbed. And, you know, they easily break down the... the the, 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 the nutrient breaks down easily. And so this eventually worsens if the person is already malnourished before becoming infected. It worsens the situation of the individual. And so because of the infection, it will then lead to weight loss. It will lead to reduced immune capacity. It will lead to some mucosal damage. And it can also lead to some good splattering in the individual. And so therefore, when somebody becomes malnourished, there's a tendency and the person at the same time has an infection, for example, with COVID-19. Then what we're saying is that um, because of the malnutrition, it takes a longer time for the person to come out of the infection, to recover from the infection. And such an individual um, suffers a more severe infection. And because of malnutrition, um, people who are malnourished are, have a higher incidence. They, they are easily susceptible to um, contracting the infection. And so malnutrition and infection is a cycle. They exist together. And you can't separate um, malnutrition from infection. And that is why you, you, as an individual, we can reorder this cycle by becoming well-nourished. When we become well-nourished, what happens is that the immune system is boosted. Um, and there's adequate weight. And then when the infection occurs, then the person does not suffer. Um, the severity of the infection is reduced and the, 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 the length of the infection is also reduced. The next slide. So diet and what is the relationship then between diet and immunity? Because all we are trying to say now is that diet is very important to boost the immunity of an individual for him or her to be able to resist an infection. So what, what is it that, what is then the relationship between diet and immunity? 
um, the relationship cannot be over, over, over emphasized. Uh, that the, there are some specific nutrients that have been identified that we know, and literature has been able to identify that this particular nutrient boosts the immune system through various mechanisms. And um, deficiencies of um, protein, of energy, and some of these micronutrients have been found to be associated with depressed immune ability in individual, and so such individuals become uh, become more susceptible to infection. And we've also know that we also know that intake of iron, of zinc, of some vitamins like vitamins A, E, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12, they are very important to maintain the immune balance and the immune function in an individual. For an imaha, for that person to be able to resist infection. The next slide. So this COVID-19 has brought a new set of challenges, a lot of challenges. Some of those challenges will include what we are doing now. Um, everybody is at home. We cannot gather, we can't meet that is social distancing, that is self-isolation. Um, and all these has been put in place to limit the spread of the virus. But then these conditions also can also um, bring about some, um, uh, some negative effects in an individual if it's not well managed. For example, because we are all isolated, we are all in our different homes, um, there's a tendency for an individual to um, pick up some poor dietary habits during this period um, like frequent snacking or snacking on very unhealthy foods. Um, a, lot of, a lot of sedentary activities are going on. Um, um, no physical activity, you just sit down, watch TV, um, play with your phone. Um, you're not able to move around. So, um, and so poor physical activity is also a very high risk factor for uh, bringing down the immune system and also predisposing one the developing infection. And also another thing that we can, that, you know, that can arise from this um, um, isolation and self-distancing and staying at home is the issue of stress. You know, staying at home all alone, having to cook um, your meals um, all by yourself um, and everything, it can lead to some physical, emotional, and some mental stress. And stress itself, has been identified to be a risk factor for malnutrition. So let's go to the next slide. So if you look at those implications of the implications of um, um, staying at home and um, self-isolating and um, distancing ourselves from each other, which is very necessary to prevent the infection, but at the same time, we must avoid picking up poor dietary habits, which includes the regular eating pattern, um, we shall avoid skipping meals or overeating um, as a result of um, staying at home all alone. Um, we shall avoid the frequent snacking or snacking on the, on the wrong kind of snack. We shall avoid, you know, just picking meals at a regular time. Um, at the same time, like I said, it can also trigger some stress, some kind of emotional um, it can trigger some physical stress, and stress has been shown to have a significant effect on dietary habits. When one is stressed, you know, it, it, it causes the release of certain hormones in the individual, which makes that person to start to crave for some salty foods and some sugary foods. Um, it can also make one to develop some unhealthy dietary habits, like just munching, you know, and um, and all these will eventually lead to poor diet quality, which is the main issue, you know, with maintaining good nutritional status. Another thing that I said is that um, this social distancing can also um, bring about a lot of sedentary behaviors. Most of us now have been at home. Some of us have not been moving around. Um, so uh, physical inactivity can lead to some inappropriate weight gain and 
eventually it will increase stress. And when stress is increased again, and then the cycle continues. So that is what happens. You know, that is one of the, 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 the limitations that we see because of this COVID-19 that has put a lot of people at home. And so as um, champions, we need to avoid um, getting ourselves into some of these habits that can trigger some, that can make our immune system to become very unbalanced. The next slide. So these are some of the things we can do, you know, to, to maintain a, a very good immune system during this period. We, we encourage to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, at the same time, we are to maintain a, a healthy weight by exercising regularly. Um, we should get enough sleep. Um, during this period also, there are a lot of information going on on the internet and everywhere. Everybody is on the internet these days. And so we should avoid spreading the wrong information and also picking up the wrong information especially about our nutrition. If you, need the, if you need the correct information, then you get it from the right people. So we should avoid um, posting wrong information and also picking up wrong information about our diet. The next slide. So we need to double our effort. We need to double our effort at this time. Um, having an understanding that the better the diet, the stronger the immune system. The better the quality of the diet, the stronger the immune system becomes. And so if as a champion you're undergoing treatment at this particular time, um, you need to get adequate calories um, that is recommended for your age and um, the disease condition and your weight. You need to um, um, having a lot of adequate diet to maintain that healthy weight and some high quality protein also to build and to replace um, worn out tissues. If you have poor appetite, uh, one of the things I always advise is to use um, some protein powders. You can add some protein powders to your smoothies, to your cereals or to soups, whichever. It works very well in improving the appetite of an individual, especially for someone who has a um, serious poor appetite. Um, vitamin C can also boost immunity. I was reading something sometimes last week and saying that um, vitamin C has been shown to um, negatively affect the treatment of cancers. But then, so um, um, I will say that if you have to use um, any supplement at this time, you may need to consult your physician but then I will recommend that we can boost our immunity by taking dietary sources of vitamin C from citrus, from purple, tomatoes, and all foods that you, you, you can identify that are good sources of vitamin C. The next slide. So like I said, diet quality is the key. To improving your immune system. So um, you have to improve on the variety. So I told us that the components of diet quality will include the variety in the diet, the moderation, the adequacy. Those are things that are very important. So the variety, pick your food from different food groups, from cereals, from legumes, from nuts, from fruit, vegetables. Pick your foods from don't restrict yourself to just from food groups alone. Bring in a lot of variety into your diet. Um, let your um, intake be adequate. Adequate. Let it be adequate. When I, when I talk about adequacy, adequate in terms of meeting your nutritional needs, your nutritional requirements. You need to exercise um, moderation in our diet. You need to be moderate about the use of certain things in our diet. Um, and except your physician is giving you some recommendations um, or maybe you suffer some food intolerances or allergies or, or that kind of thing, eat a whole lot of um, whole foods, whole grains, a food rich in fiber, 
um, this is going to help to boost your immune system because of some of the components that you find in these, like some phytochemicals and some antioxidants, it can help to boost the immune system. The next slide. So, and that happens to be like my last slide. Um, most importantly, we need to um, ensure food safety, especially in the preparation of our meals so that we don't get our system compromised, our immune system compromised. We, we need to follow strictly some um, food safety guidelines. We need to abide with them and follow them strictly. Apart from improving the quality of our diet, we also need to ensure that when we cook, we, we avoid infections from dirty hands, avoid infections from eating foods that are undercooked, um, from foods that are not properly washed, from unpasteurized foods. And the sanitary environment of our kitchen also has to be in very good condition. All these, if we can um, keep up with them, it will help to prevent a lot of infections and then um, we can continue to maintain our good immune system. As I've come to the end of this presentation, I want to say a very big thank you to the organizers of this program for inviting me. Um, and I say champions, we are all. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Doc, for um, very, very ins um, educative and um, insightful presentation on um, nutrition. It's indeed, um, is indeed something that is timely and needed at this point in time. So uh, we are going to be taking questions. Um, if you have questions, please kindly drop it in the chat box and um, we'll take it from there. Okay, so while we, while we wait for, for questions, would, um, <clears throat> okay, there's a question right here. Um, Ma, you made a mention, you made mention of high calcium diet as one of the causes of cancer and also recommended calcium, so, yes. Can we do the question after the two presentations? Okay, okay, yeah. all right. Okay. okay, so we'll, we'll just go on to the next speaker, um, Nora. Um, yeah, Nora from um, Department of Natural Sciences, Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, Ireland. And um, oh, I hope you're ready for us. Oh, great. Okay. The presentation is up already. Yes. Okay. So. Sure. Please go on. Perfect. Can you hear me there? Yes, we can. Yes, we Great. can. So uh, thanks very much, Catherine, for your presentation and to Runcy for the um, invitation to present. So uh, one of the good things about coronavirus is that we've all become familiar with Zoom and I'm here in the west of Ireland. So that's about 7,000 kilometers away. Um, presenting to you on reducing your cancer risk with food. Um, so I'll try and speak slowly, um, just in case I think my accent is pretty clear, um, but in Ireland we speak very fast, so I'll try not to speak too fast. Um, and you can type in um, if I'm speaking too fast. And I will be asking you to type uh, in a little bit with me. So Runcy asked me to talk about cancer prevention, nutrition for cancer prevention. Oh, we're skipping ahead there. Um, I think I can control the 
green here I've managed to get. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah, that's thank fine. You. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I actually though changed the title a little bit uh, because I would say that cancer prevention suggests that we can stop cancer. Whereas actually what, oh, we're gone all together. I'm sorry. Cancer, reducing our risk um, of cancer with food um, is probably more realistic because it's important to be aware that no one food can stop cancer um, and that nutrition is part of the bigger picture of what causes cancer. So I'll just make sure that I have control here. And I think, yeah, so Runcy, I'll just move my slides forward. I believe you don't need to do anything. Okay. Okay, I'm forward. I don't know if I did that or you did it or somebody magically in the middle, but I'm on the right slide at the moment. So, um, so there are many factors that impact the risk of getting cancer. Um, genetics, smoking, environmental exposures, stress, physical activity, food and drink, and lots more. But um, I just want to make sure that, you know, today we're going to be talking about food and drink and how that can reduce the risk of getting cancer. So uh, from what I understand, most of the people here maybe have had cancer or are undergoing treatment at the moment. But I suppose as champions, what you can do is you can encourage your family members, your husbands, your wives, your aunts, uncles, uh, friends to improve their nutrition to reduce their risk of getting cancer. And what I like to do is to think about as we move through some of these uh, recommendations, you know, what is your risk and what's going to motivate you? So for example, I come a fam from a family um, and on my maternal side, we've had quite a few uh, GI cancers, so colorectal cancers. And that means that I'm particularly motivated to make some of the dietary changes that will reduce my risk of colorectal cancer. So you can think about those as you move through. And we'll go for the next slide then. So just to give you an understanding of how much nutrition does impact uh, the risk of cancer, it's estimated that 30 to 40% of cancers can be prevented from using diet and lifestyle changes. So that means, well, diet is nutrition and drink, food, uh, food and drink, but also physical activity and stress. Um, it's also estimated that another 30% of cancers can be prevented from avoiding smoking. So that's a lot that we can do. It is worthwhile making these changes. So, you know, before we know what we have to do, we have to figure out why we want to do it and is it gonna make a difference? So next slide. Thank you. So um, I'm in a totally different country and I'm going to need your help to type in in the next few slides to give me food examples from Nigeria um, for the different shelves of the food pyramid. So despite being on two different sides of the world, 7,000 kilometers apart, our food guidelines are actually quite similar and uh, that's positive. So you're going to have local foods that are more common in Nigeria, but um, the guidelines really are that at the bottom of the food pyramid, we should be having fruits, vegetables, and whole grain carbohydrates. Then we should have be, be having a little bit less milk, yogurt, cheese, meats, poultry, fish, eggs, beans, and nuts. And they are all foods that provide us with protein. And here in the Nigerian food guide, those foods come together on the same shelf. And we choose less of the fats, oils, and spreads, and the foods and drinks that are high in fat, salt, and sugar. So incredibly, despite being so far away from each other, we really should be following similar food patterns. So next slide. In terms of cancer prevention, so this is for people who currently don't have cancer, um, the recommendations, um, how are we gonna follow this food pyramid to help us reduce our risk of cancer? And what I like to do is I mix it up um, and I pull my fruits and vegetables, my whole grain carbohydrates, I pull together the uh, protein foods, and next slide, suddenly with our mix up food pyramid, we have what I call the rule of thirds. So we have one plate and approximately one third of it is whole grain foods. 
one third of it is fruits, vegetables, and salads. And one third of it is protein foods. So meats, nuts, fish, egg, eggs, and dairy. So I'm going to ask everybody that can, we might take 30 seconds to a minute, to type in one food from the carbohydrate group that is very common in Nigeria for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. One fruit or vegetable that's in season at the moment. And maybe one protein food from the fish, eggs, beans, nuts, uh, maybe in a meal that you might have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So hopefully I'll get some suggestions in here to the chat box. Great, Elizabeth, thank you so much, has told me uh, that rice is common. White rice or brown rice. Yams, excellent, we don't eat those in Ireland, but I know they're very common in parts of Africa. Cassava, excellent, white rice, bread. Is it white bread? Or do you make your homemade breads? And what about maybe any samples of fruits or vegetables that are in season at the moment? Gary, cool, I've never even heard of that. Oranges, mangoes, yummy. Carrots, plenty of those here. Okay, so lovely tropical fruits. Oh, fabulous, yeah. They're all imported here in Ireland because the weather is really, really bad here. So guava, watermelon, cucumber, cabbage, banana, fabulous. Okay, great. And maybe some examples of some protein foods that are common. What types of fish would you have commonly in Nigeria? Lettuce, apples, watermelon. Got eggs and beans, great. Uh, catfish, smoked fish, chicken, mackerel. We do a lot of mackerel here as well, great. Uh, do you milk, yogurt and cheese? Yes, that's milk, cord fish, milk, great. Okay, brilliant, thank you so much guys. Crayfish, yum, and powdered milk, okay. Titus fish. So we'll move on and I'll be asking you for a few more examples again. So within that rule of one thirds, what we're trying to do is look at every meal that we eat and say, right, do I have one third fruits and vegetables in it? Do I have one third brown and whole grain carbohydrates? And do I have one third protein foods? So if that's a sandwich, um, it could be two slices of medium uh, whole grain bread. It might be making sure that we have three or four salads. So cucumber and tomato and lettuce and making sure that we have enough protein in it. So maybe some uh, tinned tuna or um, you know a full chicken breast rather than just a little bit. If it was breakfast, um, and here's an example of something we would eat in Ireland, porridge, oats plus milk and making sure that you have an apple or maybe tea and toast. If you made, I think in uh, Nigeria, do you make tea with like cocoa and milk? So milk would be your protein food, that's one third. Uh, your toast would be bread um, and that would be carbohydrates. And then how am I going to get some fruit and vegetables in there to make sure that I have one third of each of my uh, three main groups, okay? So I'm gonna add maybe an orange or a mango or something nice at breakfast. Okay, so next slide. So I'm gonna go through some tips for you trying to achieve um, that balance in your diet, which is gonna help you to reduce your risk of cancer. So in terms of fruits and vegetables, I would say eat the rainbow. So you want a wide variety of different colors of fruits and vegetables. Every fruit or vegetable that's strong in a color means suggests that they have a particular nutrient. So um, Catherine mentioned vitamin C, which is really strong in those citrus, orangey orange and yellow foods, the peppers. And um, we've got anthocyanins in our purple berries. Um, we've got lycopenes in our reds, tomatoes. So all those, there's no such thing as a superfood, I would say, but every fruit or veg is a superfood. Start early. So the recommendations here are to eat five to seven portions of fruit and vegetables in the day. And if we don't start first thing in the morning, having some fruit or vegetables at breakfast, um, then it's going to be very difficult to achieve that by the end of the day. And fresh, frozen, tinned, organic, it doesn't really matter so long as you're getting those fruits and vegetables in. So next slide. When it comes to those carbohydrates, um, you mentioned rices and cassava and yam, so fabulous. So ideally, um, trying to make sure that those carbohydrates are 
brown and whole grain where possible. This is something that we struggle with in Ireland sometimes. So I would say as it came from the ground. So as little processing as possible. So that means that you choose a whole grain rather than a white product. And when it comes to carbohydrates, what we tend to do, carbohydrates are not bad. They're very good and very important. And those whole grains are really nutritious, excellent for our gut, particularly um, those high fiber foods for reducing our risk of colorectal cancer. Um, but we need to make sure that we're just not eating too much of them. We kind of get a bit mixed up with our portion sizes when it comes to these foods. So just keeping an eye on the portion sizes. Next slide. You won't forget this. The whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. <laughs> So we are aiming for those brown and whole grains where we can. And I know that's maybe not going to be every food, uh, but it might be that you choose whole grain bread and stick to white rice. Or um, I don't know maybe how you cook your yams or cassava, but um, in Ireland, we eat a lot of potatoes. I'd encourage people to not to peel the potatoes um, and eat the potato skin as well. Next slide. In terms of our protein, it's very important that we eat protein regularly. And you've given me lots of a huge, lovely variety of uh, protein foods that you've got available in Nigeria. We want regular protein. And this is very important for cancer prevention and actually for those with cancer. And Catherine mentioned those protein uh, powders that can be useful to add to foods to make sure that we get regular protein. So we can store carbohydrate. We can store fat. Unfortunately, we all know that too well. Their hips and their bums, where all the fat goes. But we can't store protein very well. So we need to eat protein every three to five hours to make sure that our muscles have enough protein to keep them going and to maintain our muscles. And that's really important. So we want protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that goes back to our one third rule. So we also want to choose lean meats where possible. Ideally, have red meat no more than once to twice per week. We should encourage people to have oily fish. So you mentioned mackerel, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, herring are all examples of oily fish. We should be eating those once to twice a week. Um, and here in Ireland, we'd recommend three portions of dairy per day. And we're avoiding processed meats because processed meats increase our risk of colon cancer. So they include um, sausages and bacon, uh, black pudding and sliced ham. So maybe somebody could type in, are they common foods that you would have in Nigeria? And that's, they're very common foods in Ireland. So that's something we really have to work on here. Um, and we also, red meat is very common in Ireland. So I try and get people to reduce, don't eat too much of it specifically um, because it increases the risk of colon cancer. So next slide. Alongside the protein, um, it's important that we um, do a lot of exercise or enough exercise, at least 30 minutes per day of moderate intensity exercise on five days of the week or 150 minutes over the day. And we want to do aerobic exercise, so that's walking, running and cycling. Muscle strengthening exercise because we need those muscles, very important for cancer survival, both for those with cancer preventing cancer and those who've previously had cancer. Muscle is important. So some resistance training with weights um, or body weight and then balance exercises, things like yoga and um, Pilates um, and, and thing building uh, balance. So next slide. So I mentioned that we love muscle. And there's lots of reasons for cancer prevention and for just looking and feeling good. I suppose every one gram of muscles burns more calories than one gram of fat. So it helps us to maintain a healthy weight. And I'm going to show you that maintaining a healthy weight is a very important part of preventing or reducing the risk of cancer. Then we know that muscles are really important for balance and our freedom to do activities. So anybody who has had cancer will find that they maybe throughout their treatment become weak. Um, and it's important, you know, that sense of freedom, getting up and doing the activities you love, um, being strong enough to do those, um, we need muscles to do them. So we want to build muscle, have lots of muscle, and then maintain it. And then uh, for those with cancer, 
we know, and a lot of the research on this goes on in Ireland, um, is that there is a better chance of survival um, if we do get cancer, if we have a lot of muscle. So we want more muscle than to fat ratio. Next slide. Um, and uh, I'll skip this one, but yeah, it's just kind of an example that you might look healthy, you might look slim, but it's, it's about knowing whether it's the fat here, the white stuff, or the muscle, the red stuff. And um, it's important, very important throughout the cancer journey to maintain that muscle. And if we're trying to reduce the risk of cancer, also to have plenty of muscle and not so much fat. Next slide. Um, and don't panic about foods that are high in fat. So oils, avocados, nuts um, are all good sources of fat. Um, you know, we just don't want to have too much of them, okay? So don't be scared of them. And they're here on that food pyramid um, and we can have them. We just try not to deep fry things. I think Catherine mentioned that in her slides. And, um, uh, you know, just try to limit the amount of fat that we use on our bread or uh, foods like that. Our treats here, which are our foods that are high in fat and sugar, things like crisps. I think somebody might've mentioned chips jelly babies, uh, soft drinks, and chocolate, biscuits, all the good stuff, unfortunately, they're not on the pyramid. And they are actually separate because we shouldn't have those every day. Um, we should have one to two treats a week is the recommendation. And I'm sure that you have uh, Mars bars, they're worldwide. Um, so I don't know if you get those mini Mars bars, the tiny ones in the multi-pack. So that's what is considered a treat. And so, you know, in the world we live in, there's biscuits, there's chocolate. It's so widely available that we eat a lot of it. And we want to avoid too much of it. So you can skip on to the next slide. And I might skip, um, uh, we'll skip that one and skip the next one. Yep, perfect. So now moving on to kind of that's our good nutrition for everybody. And why is that going to reduce our risk of cancer? And will it really? Um, well, this is from the World Cancer Research Fund uh, and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And this is the most up-to-date document um, probably used worldwide on cancer prevention and nutrition and lifestyle. And it's a fantastic document. And we'll move through some of the recommendations. Um, so being a healthy weight, being physically active, eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, limiting consumption of fast foods and other processed foods, high in fat, starch, or sugar, limiting consumption of red and processed meats, limiting consumption of sugar-sweetened drinks, limiting <laughs> alcohol consumption, not using supplements for cancer prevention, for mothers to breastfeed your baby, and uh, after a cancer diagnosis, follow our recommendations if you can. So, um, we're going to move through these recommendations and I'll just tip through them uh, hopefully kind of quickly. So next slide. And they align with what I've said. So a lot of what I've talked about, um, eating fruits and vegetables, eating whole grains, uh, having one third of whole grains, proteins and fruits and vegetables at each meal, not having too many treats in the week. They are all going to contribute to this one, which is to be a healthy weight. And there is fairly strong evidence, I'll show you at the end, that being a healthy weight is going to reduce your risk of getting certain cancers, in particular breast cancer and prostate cancer, which are two very common cancers, and they might be ones that you're concerned about, maybe in your friends or family members. Um, and so encouraging your friends and family members to try and maintain a healthy weight um, will help um, them to reduce their risk of cancer. So ensure that your body weight during childhood and adolescence is at the lower end of the body mass index scale. Keep your weight as low as you can within the healthy range with, throughout life um, and try to avoid weight gain throughout adulthood. Um, so you could measure your waist and hip circumference or just your weight and height. So you can go online and check those if you'd like and keep monitoring them throughout. Next slide. 
The next one is to be physically active. Um, it does reduce your risk of cancer and specifically moderate and vigorous activity, which I'll show you in a moment, um, are associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. So for everybody, be moderately physically active um, and avoid sitting in front of a screen all day. So get out for a walk, do those weights or yoga um, and trying to get that balance um, of different types of exercise. So next slide. eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. So, you know, I've mentioned this as part of the general healthy diet, but in particular, this recommendation is very important for people um, who want to reduce their risk of colorectal cancer because fiber, these foods, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans will help move food through the intestines out the other side, and that reduces um, them sitting there and uh, reduces um, the risk of cancer over your lifetime. It's also important to have these foods um, for any of those cancers that might be associated with uh, overweight and obesity because these foods are high in uh, fiber. They keep you full for longer, but they aren't very high in calories. So they're good for keeping the healthy weight. So we're looking to consume a diet that provides at least 30 grams of fiber per, per day and trying to get that one third, one third, one third um, fruit and veg, protein foods, and whole grains on your plate at breakfast, lunch, and dinner will really help you to get that 30 grams. Include in most meals, uh, whole grains and non-starchy vegetables. And um, yeah, here we've got at least five portions of, or servings of uh, non-starchy vegetables and fruit every day. So you can head on to the next slide there for me. Um, aside from, you know, it's good things, we're including, trying to include positive things in our diet, but of course there's a little bit of restriction as well. So we're trying to limit the consumption of fast foods and other processed foods that are high in fat, starches or sugars, um, and that will help us to control our weight. Okay, so next one. So ideally, you know, where you can, just making healthy food choices. You don't always have to cook your own food, but you could go to a deli and you can try and pick those one third protein, one third fruit and veg, and one third carbohydrate foods. Limit consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. So that is like Coca Cola, um, Fanta. I'm sure there are lots of drinks uh, common in Nigeria that we don't drink here, um, but those fizzy and sweet drinks. So we don't want to consume them at all. You know, the, there's really nothing good in them. Um, there's no reason that we would drink them as part of a healthy diet. So we want to drink water milk, um, tea, coffee, and we can also drink uh, sugar-free um, drinks. So maybe a, you could have a sugar-free drink. Next. We want to limit the consumption of red and processed meats. So I've mentioned this, just reiterating its, its connection to cancer because red meat um, uh, increases our risk of cancer, the uh, free iron in it. So we do need iron. It's very important. So we don't want to cut out meat, but we just don't want to have too much of it. So the sweet spot is um, about three portions, um, 350 to 500 grams of cooked weight of red meat. So in Ireland, our portions in real life, uh, we actually have slightly bigger portions than they're recommending here. So in real life, I recommend uh, Irish people to have one to two portions um, of red meat in the week maximum because um, I know that in reality we eat bigger portion sizes here. So that would be beef, veal, pork, lamb, mutton, horse and goat. Um, and then our processed meats, you've mentioned I saw some uh, questions in here about meat pies. So I would expect that they are processed meats. I'm not familiar with um, what type of meat pie they are. Um, but yeah, so like a, normally in, in Ireland and the UK, uh, a meat pie would be processed meat because it would use sausage meat, sausages, bacon, uh, black and white pudding. I think that's an Irish thing. Um, sliced ham, sliced chicken. So next slide. This is um, one that culturally in Ireland, people don't like to hear, um, but it is to limit alcohol consumption. And really for cancer prevention, it is best not to drink alcohol at all, okay? Specifically breast cancer, and we will see that in a moment. So you can skip on to the next one. Um, and uh, just to familiarize people with 
uh, drinks, you know, what is, you know, achieving those uh, guidelines. Um, so in Ireland, our recommendation should be don't drink at all, but actually it's that women should have no more than 11 drinks in the week. Um, and you can see it here that a standard unit is, um, a, so a pint of cider, let's say, would be two standard units. Okay, so they could have up to five pints of cider in the week. Next slide. Sorry, I hope I'm not going too much over here, but I'm nearly at the end. So um, the final couple of recommendations are that you shouldn't use supplements for cancer prevention. Um, so like I said at the beginning, no one food is going to stop cancer, unfortunately. Um, and equally, no one supplement is going to can stop cancer either. Um, and they have looked at high dose dietary supplements um, and, you know, foods work as part of a big diet. They don't work independently. They work all together in this wonderful complex matrix. Um, so it's important that we really should go with a food first approach and get those foods. They've got so much more than a you know, a vitamin, a, an orange is so much more than just vitamin C. It's got all these extra phytonutrients and antioxidants, so, and fiber and water, and we want the big picture, so pick foods. Okay, so next slide. Um, this is important specifically for breastfeeding for women and for uh, breast cancer. And the recommendation is that mothers should breastfeed your baby if you can up to exclusively for six months and up to two years alongside appropriate complementary foods. Um, so I'm not sure, maybe somebody would type in what the culture of breastfeeding in Nigeria is like, um, but actually, unfortunately in Ireland, um, we have one of the lowest rates of breastfeeding in the world, which is really, really something that I'm really embarrassed about um, for such a wealthy country. Um, but it is important because it, it this, impacts so one it'll impact your child positively secondly it um is good for mother's weight and we know that weight is an important factor in the occurrence of breastfeeding and the third thing is that it affects how your hormones are released and um, and that also has a positive impact on your risk of breast cancer so next slide um, so this is um, the matrix from the IARC World Cancer Research Fund uh, document, and it's too small for you to see, but I've edited it but in a minute. Um, so you can see that uh, the red dots suggest different foods or diets or fluids that might have a negative impact. So increase your risk of this cancer, and we've got like mouth uh, cancer on the top here. Um, and the green ones suggest that they are going to reduce your risk of cancer. So if you go pop to the next slide, I've specifically picked out the um, breast cancer uh, results. So yeah, next slide. So I've made them a bit bigger, still not that clear, but I've typed it up here. So we've got the breast cancer, premenopausal and postmenopausal, and they are slightly different. Um, so if you uh, have not had menopause yet, the risks are slightly different. So the overall, there's a probable decreased risk. So these things are going to reduce your risk of getting breast cancer, vigorous exercise, a healthy weight and breastfeeding and a convincing increased risk. So these things cause breast cancer or increase our risk of getting breast cancer, consuming alcohol, being overweight or gaining weight as an adult specifically. So it's interesting if you think that there's a certain cancer that, you know, you might be at higher risk of or your family member, then you can go and take a quick look at this um, matrix and encourage them to adopt those behaviors that can help support um, to their reduced risk. Next slide. Um, and click on again. Yeah. So um, breast cancer is hormone related and thus the risk factors are different for women before and after menopause. So um, slightly different, but there's strong evidence to support the importance of early life nutrition and physical activity in breast cancer risk. So for maybe your nieces or your daughters or uh, young friends um, who are pre-menopause, you should encourage them to keep a healthy diet and exercise regularly from a young age and continue to encourage women to eat healthily, exercise regularly and avoid alcohol throughout their lives. Next slide. 
So I've picked out, you know, what can I do? Okay. Um, so the recommendations, it's hard to say we're going to do all of them, but we might pick out one or two um, that we're really motivated for. And so I'm a young woman here in Ireland and I do have an increased risk of stomach cancer because of my family history. Um, and I'm a woman and breast cancer is one of our most common cancers here in Ireland. So they're the two that I've picked out. And so what can I do to reduce my risk? Well, I can stay within the red meat guidelines and avoid processed meats where possible. I can eat plenty of fruits and vegetables and whole grains to keep my bowels moving. So both of those are particularly focused on the colorectal cancer. I can do more exercise because certainly as Catherine mentioned, I've been a bit lazy during the coronavirus pandemic, aiming for 150 minutes a week. I can try and maintain a healthy weight. And especially now with this coronavirus, if I'm noticing any weight gain, which I have, I'm going to keep on top of that weight gain um, and try and you know, increase my physical activity and reduce my calorie intake um, to make sure that I don't gain weight above my healthy BMI. I'm going to avoid alcohol. Well, in Ireland, culturally, that is a really big ask. So maybe I'm going to reduce my alcohol intake. And uh, if and when I have children, I'm going to breastfeed my children to reduce my risk of um, cancer in the future. So I'm going to finish. Um, there's been plenty of questions there. Um, and thank you so much, Runcy, for inviting me to present. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this uh, means it's Keshtana, uh, which means questions in Gaelic, um, which is our national language here. So um, I'll hand you back to the facilitators and hopefully we'll go through some of the questions that you've put into the chat box. And thanks so much, everybody, for typing in. Over to Chinon. So Dara and uh, Theodora. OK. Thank you very much, Nara, for your presentation. Thank you very much. So I'll just go straight to the questions. Lots of people have been dropping their questions already. So you already answered some of them during your talk. But I'll just start with, this person asks, is intermittent fasting healthy for reducing cancer risk? Um, so um, maybe Catherine will come in after me. Um, so I'm not aware of any evidence to suggest that intermittent fasting reduces cancer risk. Um, I suppose um, it's a weight loss diet. Um, there's some evidence to show that it improves diabetes risk, but I'm not aware of anything on cancer. But I suppose if weight is too high and any weight loss diet can reduce um, uh, weight and we can aim to be a healthy weight, then it could reduce risk that way. But nothing specific, you know, no more than maybe a high protein diet or a, just a simple low calorie diet or anything like that. Catherine? Okay, so... Um... Intermediate fasting, there is no evidence to suggest that uh, that can help reduce the risk of cancer. But um, I will say that um, is it, if it is just to reduce risk, I don't think there is any evidence to support that. I don't, except maybe the person is just um, wanting, is already overweight or obese and just up, uh, using that as a way of reducing the weight. But to reduce the risk of cancer, no evidence that supports that. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in Nigeria, people tend to reuse their cooking oils. They can use the same oil to fry like four or five times. So, so the person wanted to know that is re reusing cooking oils, is it healthy? Or you just use it once and you have to discard it? Okay, so do I come first for the, um, yeah, um, yeah, ma, please okay, come first. So so in responding to that question, it's actually a very wrong practice. A very wrong practice, um, you're reusing um, oils for frying especially. And if you look at most of the snacks, especially all those roadside snacks that we buy, most of them are fried with re reused oils. And um, there's a lot of danger that comes along with it, especially um, with some uh, chemicals, you know, that is deposited in the food while you reuse the oil in frying. And so it's, it's, it's actually very unhealthy to be reusing oil for frying. So you use the, 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 the quantity that will be enough, you know, at a particular time. 
Oh, okay. Great. Uh, no, I didn't have any to add. Uh, no, I think Catherine covered that. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. So, um, how safe is wheat flour? Some people believe that wheat flour, because of the all the phenols in them, that they are not that healthy. So, people don't want to eat wheat flour, and we know that white flour or normal flour is not as healthy. So, how? What do you think? Why don't they like wheat flour? They feel it has some chemicals that make it not healthy. Huh. Okay, Nora, let me bring in a little bit of Thanks. explanation into that. You see, a lot of us confuse whole wheat flour to the normal wheat flour. They are two different things. Okay, so um, because the, the we buying whole wheat flour is not a very common thing here in this part of the world. Most times people buy their wheat and then process it themselves. Now, whole wheat flour is flour that is high in fiber. Okay, so you have both the endosperm and you know the brand milled together and you have a whole wheat flour. But the, 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 the other wheat flour, which is a, the wheat flour we use for baking bread and making all our pastries is the processed wheat flour. So the, from the, the, the presentations this evening, we think that eating a lot of whole grains is seems very healthy, especially in preventing cancer. So I will suggest suggest that if we have to eat um, wheat flour, um, especially if you know your risk, um, if you know your genetic risk factors, it's better you consume. Like Nora said, she 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 told us that um, stomach colorectal cancer seems to be something in in the family, and so. She's taking all precautions to prevent um, the occurrence of such cancer. And so in, 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 in including in your diet, um, whole wheat flour will be very, very needful and very good for such an individual. So whole wheat flour is healthy and it's very okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you very much, ma'am. So uh, speaking of portion sizes, like we just hear it's one one third. Some people don't really understand how to measure portion size. In Nigeria, we really don't use portion sizes that way. Is there a better way to like explain so they can we can really understand how to control our portion sizes and how to increase portion sizes and cut down on the ones that we eat a lot of? Because I know in Nigeria we tend to eat more of carbohydrate and just little fruit. So how do you measure um, portion sizes? So um, I suppose for fruits and vegetables, one thing that we would use is the size of the cupped palm of your hand. Okay, so if you put your hand out in front of you and you kind of cup it, how much could you hold in the cupped palm of your hand? So for me, I have quite small hands actually, but you know, I could, I could hold one orange, but I could maybe hold two plums or maybe 10 or 12 grapes. Um, you know, I could hold you know, maybe two tomatoes. Um, so one, each one of those is a portion of fruits and vegetables. And I think I did see notice somebody asked about juice as well. Um, and actually juice, no matter how much you drink, will only ever count as one portion of fruits and vegetables. Um, so that's a bit sad. If you love juice, you can't have a juice or a smoothie to get your five to seven portions of fruit and vegetables. Um, it'll only ever count as one. So that's for fruits and vegetables is a good one. So the cupped palm of your hand. Um, so I suppose because, you know, I'm quite a small woman, um, but you might have a larger man using those handy portions like um, uh, based on your hand can be useful as well. So we would often um, recommend that uh, the portion of meat is this palm of your hand as well. So the bit without the fingers. Um, so that's a common uh, tool we'd use here. Uh, in Ireland for a meat portion um, and the very top of your thumb. So just this bit for fats and oils. Um, so that would be one portion of butter or oil. Um, and then for carbohydrates, we use different things um, and it depends on the carbohydrate as well. But I suppose what I would recommend is that if you go back to that concept of one third fruits and vegetables, one third protein foods and one third carbohydrate foods, what you will find is with that balance, you shouldn't end up eating the wrong.
Okay, hello. I think we lost uh, we okay. lost Nora there. Yeah. So um, I think she she has answered the question well. That's just the best way to um, to determine portion sizes here in this part of the world. We actually don't measure our food, but a third of fruits and vegetables, a third of protein, and a third of carbohydrates on your plate. It just will just be adequate, you know, for an individual. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ma. So, um, speaking on like sugar and sugar content, someone asked that, is it healthy to take fruit with high sugar content? Do they have any contribution to like sugar levels or are they healthy? I mean, fruits, fruit juices. Yes, fruits, like fruits with high sugar content, like sugar cane, like grapes, like really uh, sweet oranges. Fruits like that, are they healthy or do they impact our like, sugar level? Okay, so those fruits are actually, if it is the fruit, they're actually healthy. But taking um, drinks with added sugar will be unhealthy, will actually be very unhealthy. But taking the actual fruits themselves, because it's not just the sugar that, from the fruit that, is, that, the, that the body needs. There are some other chemicals, or other components of the fruit that also provide some benefits to the body. But Taking fruit juices with added sugar will be the unhealthy and dietary practice. Okay. We can also have Theodora bring in some other questions. Okay, so I saw one particular question that actually um, I would really love to. Somebody said she's lost like five kg. I don't know in what period, she didn't state the period said the sign of weight, weight loss, that she lost 5 kg. So she did not specifically state the period. But losing 5 kg in one month, even in two months, is a serious, um, um, is a serious issue for concern, um, especially if it is not intentional. If the weight loss is not an intentional weight loss, then it calls for serious concern. And, and I will advise that such a person needs to see um, the physician as quickly as possible. Okay, now we also have Nora back, so okay. let's keep the question coming. Theodora. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. Thank you, Nora. We really, 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 really appreciate this um, teaching. Now, um, for Dr. Catherine, um, you said in one of the slides that um, uh, we should add protein powder in our smoothies. Ma, please, what is a protein powder? Okay, so your protein powder is something you can create on by yourself. You know, um, you can think of foods that are foods that are um, very high in protein, especially um, your your legumes, and um, convert them to powders. Add them to your to your meal, to your soup, to your smoothies. You know, at every point in time when you want to consume them, it helps to increase um, the amount of protein, which is very needed. You know, just like Nora said, it's very difficult for the body to stop protein. It's difficult for the body to stop protein, but, um, but it would be good if we can, the body can store um, fat, you know, can store some carbohydrate, but not so much protein. So it, 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 it would be good if we can add some of this protein powder. So you can create your own protein powder. Think yeah. of some di good di um, dietary sources of protein and make yeah. them into powders and it will then increase yeah. the nutrition and the protein content of your food. Oh, okay, thank you. Then someone has asked a question. He said, when um, Nora was talking, she said to reduce alcohol or stop alcohol. So somebody asked a question. Is red wine an alcohol or is it acceptable? Yeah, so red wine is, yeah, absolutely alcohol. Um, so yeah, if, if for breast cancer, the recommendation is that we should have no, no alcohol. Um, so it doesn't matter whether it's red wine or white wine or anything else. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, while red wine and dark chocolate tend to get these kind of um, reputation that they're good, um, so 
I think maybe more realistic they're the best out of a bad lot potentially but um no red wine isn't isn't magically good for you we should uh, across the board limit our alcohol intake and it's um when it comes to cancer uh there's really no difference between red wine or alcohol or, you know or vodka or beer or, um it's about the grams of alcohol in it and the volume you drink so if that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Laura. Now, secondly, Laura, uh, uh, in Nigeria here, I know we are taught in the hospital that um, as a cancer patient or survivor, that we shouldn't take milk. And okay. now you're saying like three to... Three to five three portions, Three portions, yeah. portions a week, others. What do you mean by that? Can you explain for that? Okay, um, so you're recommended here not in Nigeria not to drink milk uh, if you're have cancer is that correct yes okay right um so that's interesting so that certainly wouldn't be the recommendation that we would have here in uh, ireland in the uk and um, so um but that might be to do with maybe how your milk is pasteurized or something in nigeria i'm not sure um so okay. we have a very strong dairy industry here in ireland um so and all of our milk is pasteurized to make sure that um there's a very low risk of uh, any bacteria being in it so it's very safe um, but we certainly would use milk and dairy products cheese and yogurt as excellent sources of protein and we really would encourage them because they're very nutritious um, and they um, help people to maintain that muscle mass that we really want people to maintain uh, if they have got cancer um, so um, I might pass on to Catherine, but what I will say before that, maybe she can give context uh, for why it's not recommended in Nigeria. Um, for the general population here, uh, one portion of can or one one portion of dairy of milk is you know like a little that little water cooler. Uh, yeah. plastic glass that you would get from water cooler that much so that's 200 mils it's a matchbox size portion of cheese or a kind of a standard yaple tub of yogurt um so we would be encouraging people because they're a great source of calcium protein iodine um really nutritious um we would be encouraging everybody in the community to have three portions a day and teenagers um, should have five portions because their bones are growing. Um, but maybe Catherine, you could explain why the recommendation is different for patients with cancer in Nigeria. Okay, Nora, so I, I, I'm, I'm also very surprised at this. I think I'm hearing this for the first time because um, milk itself is a whole food. It's, it's, it's complete and um, it's a lot of micronutrients in it. So um, I wouldn't know why, maybe it's, personalized nutrition for um, um, an individual, but I wouldn't know why that recommendation, but I don't think that is part of the recommendations for the management of cancers here in Nigeria, um, avoiding milk completely. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think that it is, that is absolutely correct. I'm not sure. Okay. Correct. Thank you so much, Ma. Now, um, Nora, you talked about um, coffee. And there's something you put down here. You say most our green tea and coffee be decaffeinated. So are we supposed to take coffee? Uh, and what kind of coffee should we take? So caffeinated, decaffeinated, it's up to you. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no link between the caffeine um, and uh, cancer. So just remember thinking about tea and coffee that you know too much coffee and caffeine will impact your sleep. And like Catherine mentioned that not having enough sleep will impact your food choices um, and how you feel. So that is something important to consider. And I work a lot in sport as well. And we talk a lot about a caffeine curfew. So we kind of recommend that our athletes or um, clients don't take caffeine maybe drinks after 4 p.m. Everybody's a little bit different. So you know yourself. Um, and I, the general recommendations are kind of to limit uh, caffeine coffee to three cups a day here in the west because of um its impact on the bowel but green tea there are specific recommendations that i have to say i'm not up to date with um so maybe catherine would you be able to clarify that for me yes um we uh, drinking coffee is not a very common it's not um um a very common habit here in this part of the world we okay. drink a lot of um cocoa drinks 
uh, we take a lot of cocoa drinks and some tea. But um, coffee, very few people. Um, green tea is becoming um, very common here, and um, um, a lot of a lot of um, research is going on with green tea to um, to talk about its importance, especially with some um, flavonoids and some of those things. But then I think it 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 like um, Nora said, taking coffee will will. It's, it's individual, actually it depends on the way your body reacts to it. But I would suggest that if you know that um, coffee, taking it at certain hours will prevent you from sleeping, um, then it may also induce stress because of the lack of sleep. And therefore you may need to actually know the right time um, to take the coffee or completely abstain from it if you need to. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Rosie, from my side, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I think I see some in here, um, just briefly um, about uh, um, apple. So one about, is it safe to eat the seeds from fruits like apples, soursop and pawpaw? I could say no problem eating apple seeds. Uh, I have no idea what a soursop or a pawpaw is. So. <laughs> Catherine? <laughs> I think those are tropical fruits. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but eating purple seeds, I've not actually seen any research to support um, its ability to prevent um, cancer That's or right, whatever. Yeah. But but the purple itself, it, it alone, it's actually uh, very high in a lot of vitamin A. And um, I think that is just good enough. But I'm not sure about the purple seeds. Yeah. And the, and the seeds. Nothing. Not yeah, nothing particular to do with cancer there, I don't think. Um, somebody asked for clarification about apple cider vinegar. Um, so apple cider vinegar is non-alcoholic. It's, it's vinegar, whereas cider is alcoholic. Um, uh, so, uh, so in the recommendation that we should avoid alcohol, um, avoid cider, but apple cider vinegar is totally different. Um, I have to say that uh, it is one of these apparent magic foods um but that's you know very common here in the west that we'd people say oh it cures this that and the other it doesn't cure anything um there's no evidence to support it as a functional food um so there's nothing particularly good about apple cider vinegar um and somebody asked about irish potatoes or sweet potatoes um they're both great like i said you know eat a variety of foods um because they'll provide different nutrients um and uh the, Dara, Dara yeah. can you help out and get the questions and okay. yes I okay have, okay, have okay. Have there's another question out. there's another question yes yeah, someone asks um please can we categorize goat meat as part of red meat he wants to know if it's safe to eat goat meat yeah it's a red meat yeah is it safe to eat goat meat Goat meat. Goat meat. Uh, yeah, I would say it's a just as good a source of meat as cow meat or anything else, Catherine. Yes, um, it's 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 actually um um a, a better a better um, meat than from from than beef. Um, um, like Nora recommended, it's good to take a lot of. It's better to take lean meat than red meat. Um, but um, I think goat meat is actually better. But then if you look at the quantity of, like Nora was trying to explain something when she was making our presentation, and that is very needful for us to understand. You know, if you compare the quantity, you know, she was making recommendations about one to two servings of, of red meat in a week. And so, but if you look at the portions of meat we, we consume here and the portions of meat, that is consumed in the Western world, you will not call um, our portions um, the same portions with the Western world. So um, um, I will say like three to four weeks, three to four times in a week will be ideal. But then as much as possible, um, let's just keep varieties in our diet. That's just a moderation. That's the most important thing in our diet. Let's keep varieties and keep moderation in our diet. Okay, thank you, Ma. 
So someone asked the question that does hurting stomach suggest any cancer? Does what? Hurting stomach, like stomach pain. Stomach pain. Then it, the, the person may need to actually see a physician to be able to confirm um, just having a pain in the stomach does not necessarily mean that there is cancer. It could, it could arise from all kinds of things, you know. Um, so the best thing to be able to know whether it is cancer or not cancer is actually to see a physician and undergo some, some tests to be able to confirm that. Thank you for clarifying that. Then about supplements, someone asked, there's this um, stem cell supplement. Then is it good to prevent or cure cancer? Stem cell supplement. Uh, okay, so um, there are a lot of claims. People have brought up a lot of claims about supplements. As much as possible, I particularly, especially in my presentation, I made it clear that if you have to use supplements, let it be recommended by your physician. I would rather encourage the use of natural sources of vitamins and minerals from fruits and vegetables um, rather than um, taking up supplements. But if you have to use supplements, let it be a recommendation from the physician. Okay. I don't know Thank if Nora has anything Thank to you. add to that. Um, someone asked a question. Uh, yeah, I okay. just second, Catherine, that remember that last recommendation from the World Cancer Research Fund is that, you know, uh, we avoid high dose supplements. Um, and I know the supplement you've mentioned doesn't seem to be a nutritional supplement, um, but any supplements that you should be taking would be recommended from your oncologist and dietitian, hopefully. All right. Thank you so much. Um, please, someone asked that, that if we can have examples of whole grain meal. We said whole grain meal, and they really want to know, have examples. Okay, Catherine, you might have to take this one yeah, for me because yeah, I'm not yeah, familiar yeah, with your food. Yeah, yeah. So when yeah. we talk about whole grain cereals, basically, if you look at our cereals, a lot of them, especially in the north, I think the northern part has a lot of cereals. Um, so when you pick the cereals and you eat it whole, you can process it into whatever it is you want to process. But what the basically, eating it whole. Like the maize, um, the millet, the sorghum, um, um, the wheat, and all the cereals. Um, I think the not the not the northern people will will here we we don't have too many cereals except for the ones I've mentioned. But I know that the northerners have so many of them, and so milling them into um, flour and using them to make puddings and all kinds of um, recipes will be very ideal and help um, provide the necessary nutrients that is needed from the whole grain. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question, Ronsi? Yes, there are questions. Let's just pick them up from the chat box. Dara, because, um, yes, someone asked that how can you reduce pain caused by breast cancer? Like, is there anything you can eat or recommend to like reduce pain? I'm afraid not with nutrition, Catherine. No, I'm afraid, yeah, nutrition has its limits, um, and pain, pain relief is not one of the things it can do. So that you'd have to, again, go back to your doctor and see if there's anything that they could help you with. Um, or possibly maybe a physiotherapist, depending on the type of pain, might be able to support you there. But normally your doctor. Okay, okay. I, I, okay. I saw a question. I saw a question, yeah. And I feel it's very important. She said, um, I think it's dangerous in Nigeria to bake or boil our potatoes with the skin because of chemicals and pesticides. Can you guide us in this regard? Okay, uh, so um, I know that we had an issue sometimes ago when we, there was something trading on the internet where we saw some traders using some pesticides um, on ready to eat foods that were supposed to be sold out. 
I'm spraying them with some chem chemicals. And, and I know since then, a lot of people have been very scared about um, directly eating some of these foods, especially because we believe that there are residual amounts of some of these pesticides and um, on them. Um, if you can't get your fiber from uh, potatoes, like Nora suggested, you can boil um, your, 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 your potatoes and bake them with the skin and eat them like that. If you don't want to do that because you're scared and afraid, you can also get your fiber from other sources. You can get your fiber like we talked about whole grains now. You can get your fiber from those whole grains. You can get your fiber from 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 some vegetables and some from, from fruits. And um, I think that will just uh, mix. So if you think that you are you're scared and you you are not sure that there are still some residual amount of pesticides. You may avoid taking them and look for other sources um, of getting your fiber. Yeah, I think that's great, Catherine. You know, examples might be adding some beans to a stew yeah. um, or adding nuts and seeds to um, salads or, I don't know, a porridge type things that you might eat for breakfast um, or into, you know, seeds into breads and things like that. Great sources of fiber and then eating those fruits and vegetables. So if you are concerned about um, those potatoes, uh, then uh, lots of other ways to get that fiber um, if, you know, if you're worried. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is for Dr. Catherine. Thank you. Um, some, someone said, my question goes thus. Now that COVID-19 has made lots of fresh veggies and food cars for conduction, may I know if you can tell us of any supplements that can cover for zinc, various vitamins, and many others to boost our immune system? And I remember Dr. Catherine said something like um, iron, zinc, vitamin A, E, B6, and B12 is um, good for the maintenance of immune, immune system. So, Ma, please, can you explain this further? Thank you. Okay, so like we have established initially, I don't support the use of sup supplement except it's recommended by the physician. I would mm -hmm. rather you pick your micronutrients from fruits and from vegetables and from food. There are foods that can supply some of these nutrients. Um, um, like um, a lot of fruits that a lot of fruits and vegetables are very rich in some of these micronutrients, rich in vitamins and rich in vitamin C, a lot of vitamin A. So I will suggest that though we know that they are scarce, but then it is still better to stick to getting your um, your nutrients, your vitamins and minerals from fruits and vegetables uh, rather than taking up um, um, supplements, except maybe your recommended to you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, some another person asked a question. They said cancer patients are advised, always advised to avoid spicy condiments. I want to ask if turmeric, cinnamon, and bay leaf are safe for our conduction. That's really interesting. That's not a recommendation we'd have here in Ireland. Um, I'm interested to hear about it. And sometimes we'd encourage people to use, certainly um, because of one of the side effects of cancer and its treatment is those taste changes um, that some people might find they don't have much taste. And we'd encourage them to use herbs and maybe some subtle spices to give flavor, to encourage them to you know, get that nutrition into them. Um, because if things taste bland, you don't want to eat so much and then you lose weight and that's not good for your uh, cancer survival. So, Catherine, is that a common recommendation? In no, exactly, exactly, exactly the way it is, exactly the way you have said it. That's the way it is. So, um, it's not really recommended. Um, but then if you, just to improve taste, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it might be a good idea to use turmeric or bay leaves uh, to improve taste if uh, you have cancer and that can increase the types of the food that you eat to help you maintain your weight during your cancer treatment. Thank you. Any more questions? Rossi, any more questions? 
onto my room. I'm leaving the conversation to the moderators, Dara and Samson. Okay, Dara, Samson, any more? Are you seeing anything? Okay, we have a question here. Someone said, um, you mentioned, you made mention of high calcium diet as one of the causes of cancer and also recommend calcium supplement as treatment management. How can this go together? Okay, I, I, I guess that question is for me. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of controversies about the EU, um, about um, calcium. Um, for positive cancer, um, studies have shown that um, intake of supplements above if 1,500 milligrams per day um, could make um, predispose one to the risk of prostate cancer. Um, but then, if you look at some other type of cancers, you will also discover that um, the intake of calcium may actually be necessary in the management of... So, each of these um, depending on the type of cancers we're talking about, we have to get a, 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 an, an understanding of the micronutrient that is implicated, whether for it, um, we have to understand the micronutrient that is implicated, you know, um, either as a risk factor for it, or that um, helps to also reduce the risk. So um, it's a lot of controversies, you know, in the literatures about calcium, but then, as much as possible, you can you 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 follow the recommended um, dietary allowance for calcium that is needed in the diet. Um, recently, I think I was listening to um, um, a chat a, a, a professor from the U.S. I was talking about um, blacks not getting enough ca uh, calcium um, from diet, which is actually very correct and. Um, because of this COVID-19, most of us have been indoors, we've not been going out, we've not been getting adequate amounts of sunlight that can help us to um, um, get enough vitamin D, which is needed for um, metabolizing um, the, the calcium that is needed for the body. So I would suggest that um, sticking to recommendations, guidelines is very, very important, especially from our physicians um, and for those of us uh, that are just um, not managing any disease condition, let's just stick to the dietary recommendations, you know, that has been provided. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Laura, um, do you want to come in? Um, Hello? No, I think I think Catherine covered that one. Okay. Hello? Okay. There's, there's a question here for both Laura and Dr. Catherine. Uh, the person asked, um, he said that um, pesticides and chemicals are commonly used in planting in Nigeria. So she wants to know how we can ensure that we reduce their presence in our produce for consumption. So I might start on this one, Catherine. Um, so I suppose my background, uh, we're, we're under the European Food Safety Authority, so we might have different... Um, governance uh, around pesticides and chemical use. Um, some of the things that we would recommend in Europe is that we would just wash our vegetables and fruits before we eat them. Um, but there's, I suppose what I could say is that, you know, certainly there's within pesticide use in Ireland, in uh, Europe, there's no specific pesticides that are associated with uh, cancer uh, occurrence um, here. And if we look at the bigger picture, um, washing our fruits and vegetables will reduce our risk of consuming pesticides on the outside of our fruits and vegetables. Um, but eating those fruits and vegetables will really help us to, you know, fill our bodies with goodness um, and that will protect us against cancer. So it's about striking that balance. You know, I certainly wouldn't recommend if you're worried about pesticides, you just stop eating fruits and vegetables because you have to remember the goodness that those fruits and vegetables are going to give you. Um, so if it's something that you're very concerned about, you know, washing your fruits and vegetables before you eat them, um, or, you know, I suppose potentially cooking or peeling, um, 
to reduce any residu residues on the outside. Um, but I suppose as well, just to remember that um, the, you have to balance it. Um, we don't, we know that some, some nutrition, um, you know, some good nutritional habits can reduce our risk of cancer, um, but we can't pinpoint any specific, um, any specific pesticides that are causing cancer. You know, I'm not going to pretend like they might not have a role, but like I said at the beginning, that there's a lot of things that contribute to our cancer risk, like um, the environment, um, you know, sun exposure, maybe, you know, our genetics are the really big one. So maybe not to get too caught up on that little thing, but maybe Catherine, you might come in. Um, yes, 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 it's, you, 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 you're absolutely correct. Um, If you look at permitted levels that are that farmers are allowed to use for some of these pesticides, um, the regulations that guide the use of some of those pesticides, and like Nora said, I've not come across um, any of those pesticides that have been found to be a risk for cotton cancer. So, but most importantly, if you're really afraid, then you may need to actually wash. Um, the fruits and vegetables very well before consumption. This um, can reduce some of the, the residual amount of the pesticides on the surfaces of, of the fruits and vegetables. And maybe if it is something you're really concerned about, you know, um, choosing maybe more of the fruits that, uh, like uh, you peel an orange. Um, so there's not going to be any residual pesticides on that. Um, you you know, you, you peel a mango, you don't eat the skins on those. Um, but really, I don't think, yeah, like Catherine said, you know, think about the bigger picture, um, all the benefits that those fruits and vegetables are giving you. So just, you know, rinse them uh, if it's something you're concerned about. Okay, I have a question here. Um, the question says, um, apart from radiotherapy and chemotherapy, is there any foods or vegetable or any nutrition that can kill cancer cells? No, I'm afraid not. Big picture, we love nutrition and it is so powerful to help alongside treatment, um, but it just doesn't at the moment have that power, unfortunately. I wish it did, but it doesn't. Um, probably one of the most important, a couple of the most important things that cancer or that food can do alongside your cancer treatment um, is to keep you strong and maintain that muscle. So that regular protein is something that we're really pushing here in Ireland because of the research we've done around the importance of maintaining muscle. Um, and the, the more muscle you maintain, the higher your chances of cancer survival throughout your cancer journey. Um, and then you know, um, the social aspect of food and the psychological side of it and just keeping your body going as well. But unfortunately, nothing specific um, that has the power anywhere near can uh, radio or chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have another question. Um, the relationship between food processing methods and like our foods, because some food processing methods tend to like basically kill all the nutrients in food. So, is there a way like just advise us on better food processing methods? Okay, I think I will. I will. I will love to really um, talk about that. Um, as much as possible, um, less avoid um, processing our food to the point where we lose most of the nutrients. Um, um, I talked about using very high temperatures in cooking. Um, these can pose a risk for, for so many types of cancers. But most importantly, the way we process our food is very important. Um, let me give an example, like some of our vegetables. Um, we don't have to overcook and recook and recook and recook, you know, um, 
for several days before and still consuming. By the time we do that, it loses it. It will have lost most of its its nutrient. So it's good. We eat them freshly prepared and not overly processed. Okay, ma. So is there a like a recommended like maybe baking or roasting or you just have to use lower temperature? Because in Nigeria we tend to boil a lot. So do you think we should bake more or roast or just recommend something? So boiling our food, boiling most of our food is actually very um cooking. Um roasting is a higher temperature even than boiling. Um um like i like i said at the beginning during the presentation most importantly i think we just need to apply a lot of moderation in what we do you don't have to bake and fry and fry all the time and you don't have to boil and boil all the time so you can um put in a lot of moderation into it our there's there's no particular recommendation as to um um how much of food you should eat boiled, or how much of food or fried food or baked food you should consume. But most importantly, let's avoid cooked food that are cooked at very high temperatures. Okay, thank you, Ma. So what about um, strict vegetarians that don't eat dairy products, that only take uh, vegetables? How do they get some other nutrients? Like yeah, protein. Apart from, I know that not. Yeah. But how do they get like full? Okay, so that's a yeah. good question. Um, so a strict vegetarian or a vegan, um, who maybe doesn't eat dairy products and animal products, um, they definitely need to see a dietitian. Um, so whether I suppose it maybe depends. Um, on if they have cancer or not is a big part of that. If you do have cancer, you definitely need to see a dietitian if you're on any vegan diet. Um, it's very important because it is difficult to get all of the energy and nutrients that you need um, on a vegan diet when you're healthy. Um, and it's really important that you would see a dietitian uh, to help you get the right nutrition um, if you have cancer and are on a vegan diet. If you're just uh you know part of the general population and you don't have cancer um and you're trying to get the protein foods or a good balance then on a vegan diet where you don't consume dairy or meat or animal products it is difficult and you need to put a lot of work into it actually um so you need to think about uh, for protein foods like lentils beans and legumes um so including those regularly maybe using some of those um pea flowers as well um, to boost some of your um, baked products and things like that. Um, you'd also want to um, make sure that you're including plenty of nuts and seeds. Um, and soy products can be very useful. Um, so when we look at the nutrition and the protein profile of cow's milk, and we're looking for an alternative uh, nutritionally for cow's milk, soya milk is the best alternative. So uh, here in the West, we have a lot of oat milk and coconut milk and almond milk are very common at the moment. And they just do not have the same nutritional profile. And um, they don't have the same protein or micronutrients that cow's milk provides. So um, an alternative, a suitable alternative um, or as close as possible nutritionally would be soya milk. It's a good source of protein and it should be calcium enriched to make sure you're getting that calcium. Um, but a vegan diet is quite specific. So there's a lot of work to make sure that you're getting the protein and the other nutrients um, that we get from animal sources, such as iodine and calcium. So I would recommend, you know, I think that's a whole other talk, <laughs> really. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we're done with most of the questions. Okay, there's one question here. Someone just put this on now. He said, what kind of nutri food nutrition would you advise for a person with recurrent of cancer? Um, I think it would be nice if Dr. Catherine yeah, take this. Yeah, that's At least great. She knows, <laughs> she knows the food here in Nigeria. Yeah. 
So, um, particularly there is no um, particular food, you know, that is suitable for managing a cancer that is reoccurring, okay? So, but basically, like we have been saying since we started this presentation, it's basically about um, improving your, the quality of, the, of your diet, bringing in a lot of variety, um, making sure that your intake is adequate, um, bringing in a lot of moderation into what you're eating, and um, just following the, 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 the guidelines that has been stated for the management of um, reduction in the risk of cancer. And basically, I think that can reduce, can help reduce. And Nora showed us um, a, a, a very big picture of the recommendations, the guidelines that can help to reduce the risk of cancer. So basically, I think following those recommendations will help to reduce the risk. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we just have nine minutes to close. So, last okay. questions for us to round up. I think we are, we are even done with the questions here. Okay. Yes. Excuse me. I'm Dr. Coley. Christina, please, I raised a, a worry, and it has not been attended to. Okay, go ahead, please, Dr. Yeah, Jim. on red meat, because here in Nigeria, we have a different scenario. Here, people don't even have enough to eat. And when you ask red meat being consumed, they usually tell you, ah, I don't even have enough. How often do I even see money to buy? So it's a big problem. How is Nora handling it in their own country? That's my worry. Thank you. Okay, so can I just clarify, Justina, that or Dr. Justina, that um, so you, in Nigeria, red meat isn't very common, um, and that people don't have enough red meat as opposed to having too much red meat. Is that right? <laughs> we don't have enough, and uh, the issue of enough. So, how do you handle that? Okay. I think I got you. Uh, the connection isn't very good, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So in Ireland, we have the opposite problem. Um, we have a very big uh, sheep and cow farming industry here. So we have a lot of red meat. And really what we as dietitians are trying to do is to get people to reduce their meat intake, their red meat intake, to have no more than maybe that palm-sized portion uh, twice a week. Um, but the other side, the problem with not having enough red meat, the biggest oh, issue yes. is that normally the anemia, because red meat is such a great source of uh, iron. iron. So um, I suppose some of the things, I don't, maybe Catherine could come in on it. Um, so some of the uh, interventions that might be used um, to avoid iron deficiency when there is not enough red meat or people who avoid red meat. Um, exactly. Yeah, to um, eat plenty of uh, leafy green vegetables, which are a source of iron, although they're not absorbed as well. Um, for women, actually, a big part of iron deficiency is the iron that we lose during menstruation. So um, trying to control heavy menstrual bleeding um, is some, an intervention that we would encourage uh, here in Ireland as well. Um, and then supplementation um, is quite common. It's not fortified in our foods here. Um, but another simple method that has been used is using iron pots. Um, and although again, absorption is poor, um, it can contribute to iron stores in the body. Catherine, maybe you could uh, come in there on interventions that are possible in Nigeria. Okay, so, Thank you um, very much. Uh, and in addition, we usually ask them to eat vitamin C sources of food, you know, in combination, so that they don't uh, uh, leave gap in between. As they are eating their protein sources, they are also eating vitamin C sources of, uh, you know, uh, fruits. So yeah. that it will also help in conversion, you know, 
Yeah, so oh, actually the yeah. vitamin C is particularly for those uh, plant-based products. So they're the non-heme and the vitamin C yes. helps to convert that. So um, we wouldn't be focusing on if you have red meat to have some vitamin C with it. Um, it's when you have the other, the vegetable sources. And thank, I suppose those tend to have some vitamin C in them as well. So that works out quite well. Um, but yeah, if you were having a fortified breakfast cereal, maybe having a glass of orange juice or maybe some fruit with it would be a good way to help that absorption. That's yeah. kind of broader. That, yeah, that topic is really interesting, but it's not specific to cancer. Just to be clear, that's kind of a bigger uh, issue. Catherine, would you have um, a... Yes, yes, yes. So, um, like um, she said, red meat consumption. You know, I think I said it before. Mm -hmm. So when you look at portion sizes, you can't compare the portions. And that was why when you said uh, one to two portions, I said I would recommend like three to four three to four portions, you know, of red meat. You know, we, looking at the, the, the portion sizes of red meat that we consume. Here. But then, um, like you have also mentioned, we need to also, we can also get um, um, some other dietary sources of iron, um, because red meat is actually very important for iron, so we can get our iron from other um, vegetable sources, and um, um, and take a lot of vitamin C to convert from. But if you're taking it from the red meat, actually, you really don't need, like Nora have explained, you actually don't actually need to take vitamin C um, for the conversion. Wow. <laughs> And then the, I just typed it in here that the things like eggs and spinach and those leafy greens are a great source of iron and white meats. So fish and chicken, they do also have some iron in them. They just don't have as much as the red meat. Um, so if we have kind of a good balanced diet, even if you were to avoid red meat altogether, not that we're recommending that, you know, you could still hopefully get your um, iron from a variety of foods. So just going back to that basic message of getting a good variety that me and Catherine have both been encouraging um, with, you know, those protein foods, whether it's from dairy, eggs, pulses, uh, nuts, seeds, meat, um, the fruit and vegetables, which like uh, Dr. O'Coley mentioned, are great source of vitamin C, so, um, and then our whole grain carbohydrates at each meal, then hopefully you'll be able to get that iron as well as all the other great things that food can provide for you. Wow. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Um, the moderators, do we have additional questions or we should round up? I think we're running out of time already, right? Yeah, yes, we are done, done with the question. question. It's good we round up. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, honestly appreciate, I want to really appreciate every one of us, um, especially our speakers. This has been very, very, uh, very, very interesting, you know, conversation. Really, really appreciate you. Especially, I think it's more interesting because we have like two perspectives to it, right? We have um, Professor Catherine, who is a Nigerian uh, dietitian and nutritionist. And then we also have Nora, who is coming from Ireland. So we're having like you know, from the Irish and the Nigerian perspective, uh, because I think it's really important now because the whole world, it's so difficult for us to really differentiate because food from Ireland are all visible in Nigeria and, you know, also food from different parts of the world. So, and that's why I really want to appreciate everyone you and also want to appreciate Nora. I know this came at a very, very short notice. I know I <laughs> would greatly, I sincerely appreciate you on behalf of Project Pink Blue. I want to really thank you so much for, for accepting to come make this presentation. And also want to also thank Professor Catherine for her time as well. Really, really appreciate it. Do you have Madam Khadija? Madam Khadija, I think we have her. Madam Khadija, you want to say something? Madam Khadija. Oh, I think we lost that. What about Gloria? Do we have Gloria, the president of the support group? Okay. Okay, I think on this premise, we'll probably be ending the meeting right now. 
And don't forget that once we end the meeting, you still have a few seconds to just catch up with friends and chat. So once we end the meeting, I'm just going to unmute everyone and then we'll all catch up and say hi to our friends and stuff like that. And for people who are just joining us for the first time, these are our monthly meeting. We're having another meeting again in June. It's happening on 27th of June. Please, we encourage you to just mark uh, the date 27. And for 27th of June, we're having three very important speakers. The granddaughter of Nelson Mandela, uh, Zuleka uh, Mandela. She's a two-time breast cancer survivor. And so she'll be speaking with us. And we're also working very hard to see if we can get Professor Olika. She's a prostate cancer um, survivor. And um, we've already confirmed. Emeka, please, can you mute your, your Instagram? Uh, well, we have already confirmed um, Riona J. Mayer, who is uh, a journalist and also a breast cancer survivor herself. She's based in Germany. So please mark your date. Don't forget Saturday 27th June. Uh, it's very important. We're having two sections. We're having a session in the morning by 10 a.m. and the other one by 4 p.m. So please mark your calendar and ensure to join us. You'll definitely get an email. You also get um, you know, information around how to sign in and all the rest. Uh, thank you so much. On behalf of Project Pink Blue, I want to appreciate every one of you. Um, for joining in and enjoy the rest of your day. But before then, I'm sorry, let's take a group picture, please, before I forget. Yeah. So uh, for the group picture, we encourage everyone to put up their video. If you can turn your video, that would be very interesting. We'll really be happy to see your face. And also don't forget that the pictures are gonna go on social media. So if uh, you're not too comfortable with having your pictures on social media, you don't have to do that, but otherwise, you can do your makeup and look good. And <laughs> let's get the, the fun picture happen. We're gonna take two pictures. One, natural smile. Another one, we'll all have everyone have their thumbs up this way, right? Okay, so I'm going to unmute everyone um, so that you all can also talk. I can hear you all. <laughs> So the first one is just smile. The said next one you just do thumbs up. Okay, we're doing the first one now. Are you all ready? Can I see the yeah, yeah. the first one. We're taking the first one again for what do I do? We're doing the second one now. Thumbs up. Everyone. <laughs> Your hand. Good, thank you. Thank you, Because there's no light. light. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I just want to appreciate some very new friends who joined us. Thank you so much. He's the former director of um, um, we also want to thank um, Dr. Justina Okoli. She joined all the way from Enugu. Kyra joined us from the UK. Yeah. Um, we have Lee joined us from New York. Um, I think we have the world. The world is really here. We have uh, Madame Khadija all the way from Ilori. We have Elizabeth from Abuja, Emeka. Um, I mean, I can't mention everyone, but thank you all so much for joining and really, really appreciate it. Yes. And please don't forget, this video is going to be available on YouTube. Just go on YouTube and type Project Pink Blue, and you'll get all the videos okay. and the previous video will be on. Thank you, Mr. Rawson. Thank you.